My name's Dan Snow and I want to tell you about History Hit TV. It's like the Netflix for history. Hundreds of exclusive documentaries and interviews with the world's best historians. We've got an exclusive offer available to fans of Timeline. If you go to History Hit TV, you can either follow the information below this video or just Google History Hit TV and use the code TIMELINE, you get a special introductory offer. Go and check it out. In the meantime, enjoy this video. The story of the tank begins in the First World War, when armoured all-terrain fighting vehicles were first deployed as a response to the problems of trench warfare. Their arrival on the Western Front ushered in a new era of mechanised warfare. Though initially crude and unreliable, tanks eventually became a mainstay of ground armies. By the Second World War, tank design had advanced significantly and tanks were used in quantity in all theatres of the war. The Cold War saw the rise of modern tank doctrine and the general purpose main battle tank. The tank still provides the backbone to land combat operations in the 21st century. The tank was originally designed as a special weapon to solve an unusual tactical situation, the stalemate of the trenches on the Western Front. It was a weapon designed for one simple task, crossing the killing zone between trench lines and breaking into enemy defences. The armoured tank was intended to be able to survive artillery bombardments and machine gun fire and pass through barbed wire in a way infantry units could not hope to thus allowing the stalemate to be broken. Numerous concepts for armoured all-terrain vehicles had been imagined for a long time. With the advent of trench warfare in the First World War, the Allied French and British developments of the tank ran largely in parallel and coincided at the same time. In 1903, a French captain, Le Vavasseur, proposed a self-propelled cannon moved by a caterpillar system and fully armoured for protection. Powered by an 80 horsepower petrol engine, the Le Vavasseur machine would have had a crew of three, storage for ammunition and a cross-country ability. But the viability of the project was disputed by the Artillery Technical Committee and it was formally abandoned in 1908. When the First World War broke out in 1914, no one imagined how quickly the conflict would stagnate into trench warfare. Within months, both sides had dug trench systems that ran from the Belgian coast right down to the Swiss border. The ground between the two lines was known as no man's land. Over the next four years of war, millions of men became casualties in the efforts to take this land and push the other side back. In places, it was just a few metres wide, in others, considerably more. This killing field was churned up by artillery bombardments and traversed by machine guns. Any movement became virtually impossible. The pulling power of crawling-type tractors soon drew the attention of the military. Holt tractors were used to replace horses to haul artillery and other supplies. The Royal Army Service Corps also used them to haul long trains of freight wagons over the unimproved dirt tracks behind the front. Holt tractors were, ultimately, the inspiration for the development of the British and French tanks. By 1916, about 1,000 of Holt's Caterpillar tractors were used by the British in the First World War. From late 1914, a small number of middle-ranking British Army officers tried to persuade the War Office and the government to consider the creation of armoured vehicles. Amongst their suggestions was the use of Caterpillar tractors. But although the Army used many such vehicles for towing heavy guns, it could not be persuaded that they could be adapted as armoured vehicles. The consequence was that early tank development in Great Britain was carried out by the Royal Navy. In 
As a result of an approach by Royal Naval Air Service officers who had been operating armoured cars on the Western Front, the First Lord of the Admiralty, Winston Churchill, formed the Landships Committee on the 20th of February 1915. The Director of Naval Construction for the Royal Navy, Eustace Tennyson Dane Court, was appointed to head the committee in view of his experience with the engineering methods it was felt might be required. The two other members were naval officers and a number of industrialists were engaged as consultants. So many played a part in its long and complicated development that no individual can be credited as the sole inventor of the tank. Their first design, Little Willy, ran for the first time in September 1915 and served to develop the form of the track. However, its trench crossing capabilities were limited and so a rhomboidal form was adopted, better able to cross the trenches. In January 1916, the prototype, nicknamed Mother, was adopted as the design for future tanks and an order for 100 units was placed. By the end of the war, about 2,600 tanks of various types were built. Tanks armed with naval cannon and machine guns were known as males, while those armed only with machine guns were called females. The name tank was introduced in December 1915 as a security measure. During manufacture, they were falsely described as water carriers, supposedly for use on the Mesopotamian front. In conversation, the workers referred to them as water tanks, or simply tanks. The name stuck and has remained ever since. At the same time in France, several attempts were made to design vehicles that could overcome the German barbed wire and trenches. In 1914, the French began experimenting with the Boireau machine. This machine was made of huge parallel tracks formed by 4x3 metre metallic frames rotating around a triangular motorised sensor. This device proved too fragile and slow, as well as incapable of changing direction easily, and so was abandoned. In 1915, attempts were also made to develop vehicles with powerful armour and armament, mounted on the cross-country chassis of agricultural tractors with large dented wheels, such as the Obra Gabe Fortress. The vehicle was powered by electricity, complete with supply cable, and armed with a 37mm Navy cannon, but it too proved impractical. At the same time, the French arms manufacturer Schneider began experiments using a Holt tractor as a base. At the end of January 1916, an order for 400 Schneider CA-1 tanks was placed, although problems with meeting production schedules meant that the first deliveries were delayed until September 1916. And so it was the British who were the first to send tanks into battle on September the 15th, 1916, at Flair Corselet as part of the wider Somme offensive. 49 were committed, of which 32 were mechanically fit to take part in the advance and achieved some small local successes. Although the first French designs were produced in large numbers, both suffered consistently high losses. In 1918, the Renault FT light tank was the first tank in history with a modern configuration, a revolving turret on top and an engine compartment at the rear. It would be the most numerous tank of the war. The German response was to develop its own armoured programme. Soon the massive A7V appeared. The A7V was a clumsy monster, weighing 30 tonnes and with a crew of 18. By the end of the war, only 20 had been built. Although other tanks were on the drawing board, material shortages limited the German tank corps to these A7Vs and about 36 captured Mark IVs. The A7V would be involved in the first tank versus tank battle of the war on April 24, 1918, at the Second Battle of Villa Bretano, a battle in which there was no clear winner. Numerous mechanical failures and the inability of the British and French to mount any sustained drives in the early tank actions cast doubt on their usefulness. 
and by 1918, tanks were extremely vulnerable unless accompanied by infantry and ground attack aircraft, both of which worked to locate and suppress anti-tank defences. But General John J. Pershing, Commander-in-Chief of the American Expeditionary Force, requested in September 1917 that 600 heavy and 1,200 light tanks be produced in the United States. When General Pershing assumed command of the American Expeditionary Force and went to France, he took Lieutenant Colonel George Patton. Patton became interested in tanks and chose to go into the newly formed U.S. Tank Corps, becoming the first officer so assigned. Although the tank of World War I was slow, clumsy, unwieldy, difficult to control and mechanically unreliable, its value as a combat weapon had been clearly proven. But despite the lessons of World War I, the combat arms were most reluctant to accept a separate and independent role for armour and continued to struggle among themselves over the proper use of tanks. At the war's end, the main role of the tank was considered to be that of close support for the infantry. During the Second World War, the first conflict in which armoured vehicles were critical to battlefield success, the tank and related tactics developed rapidly. Armoured forces proved capable of tactical victory in a short amount of time. Heinz Guderian, a German tactical theoretician who was heavily involved in the formation of the first independent German tank force, said, where tanks are, the front is. And this concept became a reality in World War II. Guderian initially envisaged an armoured corps, or panzer corps, in which armour, highly mobile infantry and air support were combined. But following the Treaty of Versailles, Germany's army was restricted to no more than 100,000 men and it was forbidden to have any armoured vehicles. Following the rise to power of Adolf Hitler and the Nazis during the 1930s, Germany began to rearm, albeit in great secrecy. The limitations of the Versailles Treaty meant that the first Panzerkampfwagen, or Panzer for short, had to be developed under the guise of farm equipment. Thus, the first Panzer I that appeared in 1934 was designed primarily for training the fledgling Panzer Corps. At 5.4 tonnes, it was light and its armour was no thicker than 13 millimetres. Its main weapon was two 7.92 machine guns. However, it only needed a crew of two, a driver and commander, who also operated the guns. Although initially intended as a stopgap, the Panzer II was to become the most numerous German tank in the early years of the war. The Panzer II entered service in 1935 and featured a 20mm gun mounted in the turret as its main armament. It weighed 8.9 tonnes and was operated by a crew of three, a driver, loader and commander. Armour was 13mm at its thickest on the sloped front, sides and rear, although the later Mark D had its frontal armour increased to 30mm. Both Panzer I's and II's saw service in the Spanish Civil War as part of the Condor Legion. As well as gaining valuable combat experience, a number of lessons were learned about equipment. Although the tanks could withstand machine gun fire, they were vulnerable to shell fire. The Panzer III was a medium tank designed to engage and destroy enemy tanks and was intended as the main tank of the Panzer divisions. Its key feature was its three-man turret, which enabled the commander to concentrate on battle awareness and not get distracted by what the gunner or loader were doing. As well as commander, gunner, loader, there was a driver and radio operator who also operated the forward machine gun mounted in the bow. The Panzer III's main armament was, at first, a 37mm gun, although this was upgraded to a 50mm gun and then a 75mm weapon following experience in the Russian campaign. 
When up against the Soviet's T-34, it was clear that there was the need for a larger, more powerful gun. This led to the Panzer III swapping roles with the Panzer IV and being redesignated in the infantry support role. The Panzer IV also entered service in 1939 as an infantry support tank, but it found itself filling the role of tank fighter during the Russian campaign. Robust and reliable, it saw service in all combat theatres involving Germany and has the distinction of being the only German tank to remain in continuous production throughout the war, with over 8,800 produced between 1936 and 1945. During the 1930s, France became one of the world's largest manufacturers of tanks and by the beginning of the Second World War had a tank force equal to, if not greater than that of Germany. However, in French eyes, the tank was viewed as another weapon system whose role was to assist the infantry in its forward progress. As a result, the need for speed was considered less important than heavy armour and weapons. The Renault FT-17, which first saw service in the First World War, had a long life and saw use in World War II and even later in Indochina. France continued to export the FT-17 right up to the Second World War. By the mid-1930s, the French army was replacing the ageing FT-17 fleet with a mixed force of light tanks, both in the infantry and cavalry branches, as well as medium and heavy tanks. The infantry light tanks included the Renault R35, which followed the FT-17 concept quite closely, with its very small size, two-man crew, and a short 37mm gun. It was, however, heavily armoured, the R-35 was mostly used to equip an armoured reserve intended to reinforce infantry divisions in breakthrough operations. France also produced what may have been the best tank of the 1930s, the Somua S-35. The S-35 had a long 47mm gun that could kill any tank then in service, as well as heavy cast armour, as well as good speed. The Char B was a very formidable tank with heavy cast and riveted armour. Unlike other French tanks, all Char Bs were equipped with radios and as the Germans were to discover during the Battle of France, the Char B was nearly invulnerable to other tanks. The most produced tank of the 1930s was the Russian T-26 which owes its origin to the British-built Vickers six-ton light tank. Although less sophisticated than some of its later contemporaries, the T-26 was well-balanced, relatively modern and cheap to produce, which meant it was well-suited for mass production. By the time war broke out in September 1939, an astonishing 10,000 units had been built. Even on its own, the T-26 made the Red Army the biggest armoured force in the world. When Germany invaded Russia in the summer of 1941, Red Army tanks outnumbered the Germans by 4 to 1. The Panzers may have had more modern tanks and were undoubtedly tactically superior, but they found themselves confronting swarms of these light tanks on a daily basis. The earliest production model featured twin turrets housing two 7.62 machine guns. Later models were equipped with a powerful 45mm main gun. At the outbreak of war, the Red Army's other main tank was the BT series of fast, well-armed but lightly armoured tanks. A key development was the incorporation of a suspension system designed by the American J. Walter Christie. It allowed substantially longer movement of the wheels than conventional leaf spring systems then in common use. This in turn allowed tanks to have considerably greater cross-country speed, especially in vehicles with high power to weight ratio. The first BT-2 entered service in 1932. Equipped with a 37mm gun, it was developed through to the BT-7, which shared its turret with the T-26, 
housing a 45mm main gun. BT-7s fought on every front the Red Army fought in, but were gradually replaced by arguably the most successful tank ever, the T-34. The T-34 was a medium tank, which had a profound and permanent effect on the fields of tank tactics and design. First deployed in 1940, the T-34 possessed the best balance of firepower, mobility, protection and ruggedness of any tank. Its 76.2mm high-velocity gun was the best tank gun in the world at the time. Its heavy, sloped armour was impenetrable by standard anti-tank weapons and it was very agile. The T-34 was the mainstay of Soviet armoured forces throughout World War II. The design and construction of the tank were continuously refined during the war to enhance effectiveness and decrease costs, allowing steadily greater numbers of T-34s to be fielded despite heavy losses. It was the most produced tank of the war, and the second most produced tank of all time, after its successor, the T-54-55 series. The Red Army also had a very effective KV-1 as its heavy tank. Equipped with a 76mm gun, the KV-1 entered service in 1939. It was so heavily armoured that it was impervious to any other tank-mounted gun, which came as a shock to the Germans following their invasion of Russia in 1941. A second version, equipped with an enormous bunker-busting 152mm howitzer, was designated as the KV-2. But its weight and top-heavy turret meant that this monster could not be widely deployed. The first tank to go into battle during the First World War was a British design. It was a heavy tank intended to help break down enemy defences in close concert with the infantry. Heavy armour able to withstand direct hits was more important than speed as infantry advancing on foot were relatively slow. But it was soon realised that smaller, faster and likely armoured tanks also had a role in exploiting any breakthroughs and cutting lines of supply and communications. Although conceived in 1916, the Whippet did not go into action on the Western Front until March 1918. It immediately played a small but important role in helping stem the tide of the German Spring Offensive, which had nearly succeeded in driving British forces into the sea. During the years between the two world wars, Britain, like France, developed tanks for two distinct roles, the heavy infantry tank and light tanks, or cruisers, which were intended to take on the role of the cavalry and exploit any gaps created by the infantry. One of the earliest designs was the Vickers light tank, which began life in 1928 as a private venture. The Carden Lloyd tankette was another development of the light tank theme. The two-man versions were sold to armies all over the world, although in British hands it became better known as the Universal Carrier. In the years leading up to the Second World War, a number of cruiser tanks were developed, but as the early battles of the war were to show, speed alone was not enough for survival. Thicker armour and greater firepower was needed if British tanks were to win their battles with German armour. The cruiser Mark VI, or A-15 Crusader, was one of the primary British cruiser tanks of the early part of the Second World War, and perhaps the most important British tank of the North African campaign. The Crusader's mobility made it a favourite of British tank crews and once upgraded with the six-pounder main gun made it more than a match for the early Panzer III and Panzer IV tanks it faced in combat. By late 1942, the lack of armament upgrade combined with the presence of Tiger I tanks among the Africa Corps and reliability problems due to the harsh desert conditions led to the Crusader being replaced in the main line of battle by the US-supplied M3 Grant and the M4 Sherman medium tanks. <laughs> 
In the British Army, the heavy tank was an infantry tank. The Mark I and II Matilda was the mainstay of the heavy tank force in the early years of the war. At over 25 tonnes, the Matilda boasted up to 78 millimetres of armour, which made it more than a match for its contemporaries. When it was first deployed in North Africa, its heavy armour was virtually impervious to German and Italian anti-tank weapons, except the mighty 88 mm But as the Germans improved the weapons on its tanks, the Matilda's slow speed, lack of manoeuvrability and firepower meant it was no longer effective. During the years between the First and Second World Wars, tank design and development in the United States lagged behind what was happening in Europe. At the end of the First World War, the Tank Corps relied on the French FT-17 and British Mark V heavy tanks. But once the control of the Tank Corps passed to the infantry, investment in new designs stalled. As the Blitzkrieg rampaged through Europe, the Americans realised that light tanks needed better armour and weapons. The Western Desert campaigns showed that lightly armed tanks were no match for the Panzer III's and IVs of the Africa Corps. The US Army needed a good tank and coupled with Great Britain's demands for 3,650 medium tanks immediately, the M3 Lee began production by late 1940. Also known as the Grant, the new M3 outclassed the available British tanks and was able to fight German tanks and towed anti-tank guns. But the tall silhouette and low hull-mounted 75mm gun were severe tactical drawbacks since they prevented the tank from fighting from hull-down firing positions. Also, the use of riveted armour led to a problem called spalling whereby the impact of enemy shells would cause the rivets to break off and become projectiles inside the tank. Later models were welded to eliminate this problem. The M3 was replaced by the M4 Sherman. The M4 was the best known and most used American tank of World War II. Christened Sherman by the British, the M4 Sherman was a medium tank that proved itself in Allied operations in North Africa, Europe and the Pacific theatres of war. The Sherman was a relatively inexpensive and easy to maintain tank and ultimately became a combat system that won the ground war for the Allies through sheer numbers. Over 50,000 Shermans were built, a number only surpassed by the T-34. It was the first to carry a fully traversing turret housing a 75mm gun. From the outset, it was designed for mass production in that it was cheap and easy to build and maintain. They were also reliable, sturdy and fast and was to prove itself a good all-round fighting vehicle when it first went into battle in North Africa in 1942. During the invasion of Poland in September 1939, tanks performed in a more traditional role in close cooperation with the infantry units. But in the Battle of France the following May, deep independent armoured penetrations were executed by the Germans, a technique later called Blitzkrieg. Blitzkrieg used innovative combined arms tactics and radios in all of the tanks to provide a level of tactical flexibility and power that surpassed that of the Allied armour. The French army, with tanks equal or superior to the German tanks in both quality and quantity, employed a linear defensive strategy in which the armoured cavalry units were made subservient to infantry 
In addition, they lacked radios in many of their tanks and headquarters, which limited their ability to respond to German attacks. In accordance with Blitzkrieg methods, German tanks bypassed enemy strongpoints and could radio for close air support to destroy them or leave them to the infantry. Motorized infantry was a related development that allowed some of the troops to keep up with the tanks and create highly mobile combined arms forces. The defeat of a major military power within weeks shocked the rest of the world, spurring tank and anti-tank weapon development. The North African campaign also provided an important battleground for tanks as the flat, desolate terrain with relatively few obstacles or urban environments was ideal for conducting mobile armoured warfare. However, this battlefield also showed the importance of logistics, especially in an armoured force, as the principal warring armies, the German Africa Corps and the British Eighth Army, often outpaced their supply trains in repeated attacks and counter-attacks on each other resulting in complete stalemate. This situation would not be resolved until 1942, when during the Second Battle of El Alamein, the Africa Corps, crippled by disruptions in their supply trains, had 95% of its tanks destroyed and was forced to retreat by a massively reinforced 8th Army. The first in a series of defeats that would eventually lead to the surrender of the remaining Axis forces in Tunisia. When Germany launched its invasion of the Soviet Union, Operation Barbarossa, the Soviets had a superior tank design, the T-34. A lack of preparations for the Axis surprise attack mechanical problems, poor training of the crews and incompetent leadership caused the Soviet machines to be surrounded and destroyed in large numbers. However, interference from Adolf Hitler, the geographic scale of the conflict, the dogged resistance of the Soviet combat troops and the Soviets' massive advantages in manpower and production capability prevented a repeat of the Blitzkrieg of 1940. Despite early successes against the Soviets, the Germans were forced to upgun their Panzer IVs and to design and build both the larger and more expensive Tiger heavy tank in 1942 and the Panther medium tank the following year. In doing so, the Wehrmacht denied the infantry and other support arms the production priorities that they needed to remain equal partners with the increasingly sophisticated tanks. Armed with an 88mm gun and improved armour-piercing shells, Tigers were only allocated to elite units. Although defeated at the Battle of Kursk in 1943, the Tigers had proved their capabilities. During the Battle of Tunis in 1943, only 11 Tigers were available, of which only four survived. But they claimed over 100 US and British tanks destroyed. By the time of the Normandy campaign in the summer of 1944, the Tiger II was ready for battle. Although few in number, they claimed a high price in Allied tank crews' lives. On average, it took five to six Shermans to destroy one Tiger. Their only chance was to try and outflank the Tiger and fire at point-blank range with an armoured piercing shell. In open country, a well-concealed Tiger could take out an entire platoon before they got within range. But superior numbers of Allied tanks combined with rocket-firing typhoons meant that the Tiger's days were numbered. Soviet developments following the invasion included upgunning the T-34. Development of self-propelled anti-tank guns such as the Su-152 and deployment of the IS-2 in the closing stages of the war. 
Specialised self-propelled guns, most of which could double as tank destroyers, were also developed by the Germans and the Soviets. These turretless, casemate-style tank destroyers and assault guns were less complex, stripped-down tanks. The firepower and low cost of these vehicles made them attractive. Indeed, the Sturmgeschutz III, Stug for short, was the most produced of all German tanks throughout the conflict. Originally produced as a close support infantry weapon, Stugs were able to switch to the role of tank hunter with ease. But as manufacturing techniques improved and larger turret rings made larger tank guns feasible, the gun turret was recognized as the most effective mounting for the main gun to allow movement in a different direction from firing. Much like the Soviets, when entering the Second World War in December 1941, the United States' mass production capacity enabled it to rapidly construct thousands of relatively cheap M4 Sherman medium tanks. Although a compromise all round, the Sherman was reliable and formed a large part of the Anglo-American ground forces. But in a tank versus tank battle, it was no match for the Panther or Tiger. Numerical and logistical superiority and the successful use of combined arms allowed the Allies to overrun the German forces during the Battle of Normandy. Upgun versions with a 76mm gun were introduced to improve the M4's firepower. One Allied tank that was equal to the Tiger in terms of firepower was the Sherman Firefly. The long-barreled 17-pounder gun was more than capable of penetrating the Tiger's armour. The Germans soon realised the threat from the Firefly and made them a priority target. Tank hulls were modified to produce flame tanks, mobile rocket artillery and combat engineering vehicles for tasks including mine clearing and bridging. Although the Shermans remained the most common type in armoured British and Commonwealth units, other designs were also used. The Churchill was the last British-designed infantry tank, but suffered from being rushed into service. Following the Dieppe raid in August 1942, German newsreels of the day lingered on shots of Churchills bogged down in pebbles, where they were easily picked off at almost point-blank range. But in the battle for Tunisia, they proved their worth, as they could cover difficult terrain where other tanks failed. The Cromwell that went into service during the Normandy campaign proved to be a very capable cruiser tank, despite its problematic development. It was faster and had a lower profile than the Sherman tank, and at 76mm considerably thicker frontal armour than the 51mm of the Sherman. This was later increased to 100 millimetres. There were also more tanks coming from the US as the war entered its final stages. The M24 Chaffee was a fast but lightly armoured light tank that arrived in Europe in the winter of 1944 as a replacement for the Stuart. Although too few of them were delivered to make any substantial impact on the ground war, they were to see extensive service during the Korean War. Crews liked the improved off-road performance and reliability, but were most appreciative of the 75mm main gun, which was a vast improvement over the Stuart's 37mm weapon. A key lesson from the disastrous Dieppe raid was the need for specialised tanks that could get ashore quickly and set about attacking the enemy's defences. In the planning for Operation Overlord, the amphibious landings on the French coast, a range of specialised vehicles were tried and tested. The majority of the designs were modified Churchills and Shermans. Both were available in large numbers. The Churchill had good, although slow, cross-country performance, heavy armour and a roomy interior, while the Sherman's mechanical reliability was highly valued. Some, like the flail tanks used for clearing paths through minefields, had already been tried in North Africa. The Crocodile was a tank fitted with a flamethrower in place of the machine gun, 
the range was over 120 meters, which was much more than the handheld versions. Psychologically, it was a powerful weapon that proved very effective in clearing bunkers and trenches. Sherman's using a similar idea were used in the Pacific Theater as US forces fought their way across from island to island, clearing away the fanatical Japanese defenders. Other tanks could carry bridging and fording kits such as girders, ramps and bundles of wooden poles, as well as rolls of matting. But arguably the most extraordinary of all these specialized vehicles were the swimming DD tanks. DD stood for duplex drive. Using the concept of Archimedes principle, the tank was equipped with a watertight canvas screen, which when raised, enabled the tank to float. A small propeller driven by the tank's motor was attached. As the landing craft approached the enemy coast, the tanks would drive off the ramps and head for the shoreline. Once on the beach, the screen was lowered with a pull of a lever. Valentines were used for much of the testing. This example, performing at a public display, shows the screen folded down onto the hull. Valentines were ordered into production in great haste to supplement the Matildas in 1939. Although sturdy and reliable, further development was hampered by its small size. Although initial tests proved that indeed tanks could float, their future success depended on a flat sea state. On D-Day, June 1944, the seas were rough. Rather than risk launching the tanks thousands of yards out as planned, the British decide to bring the landing craft in closer to the shore. But the Americans stuck with the original plan and launched their tanks too far out. They were quickly swamped and sunk, leaving the troops pinned down on Omaha Beach without armor. Here, the casualties were the highest of all the landings. By the end of the Second World War, the benefits of integrating all available arms into a mobile, flexible team was widely understood. But just at the moment when countries began downsizing their armed forces, a new threat to world peace emerged. During the Cold War, tension between the Soviet-dominated Warsaw Pact countries and the countries of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, created an arms race that ensured that tank development proceeded largely as it had during World War II. The medium tanks of World War II evolved into the main battle tank, or MBT, of the Cold War and took over the majority of tank roles on the battlefield. Economies of scale led to serial production of progressively upgraded models of all major tanks during the Cold War. The essence of tank design had been hammered out in the closing stages of World War II. Large turrets, capable suspension systems, greatly improved engines, sloped armour and large calibre guns, 90mm and larger, was standard. Tank design during the Cold War proceeded along these lines with the addition of improvements to fire control, gyroscopic gun stabilization, communications and crew comfort. There was also the introduction of laser rangefinders and infrared night vision equipment. Armour technology progressed in an ongoing race against improvements in anti-tank weapons, especially anti-tank guided missiles like the TOW. Among the tanks of the 1950s were the British Centurion and Soviet T-54-55 and the US M-48. These three vehicles formed the bulk of the armoured forces of NATO and the Warsaw Pact throughout much of the Cold War. The Centurion 
was the first of the three to enter service in 1945. It was a watershed in medium tank design, utilising all the lessons learned through nearly six years of conflict. It was also the precursor of the main battle tank, the MBTs of the future. The T-55, which went into production in 1948, became the most widely used Cold War tank, or any other MBT since. Over 100,000 have been built, and it has seen action in no fewer than 32 conflicts. Tanks and anti-tank weapons of the Cold War era saw action in a number of proxy wars, like the Korean War and Vietnam War. In these wars, the USA or NATO countries and the Soviet Union or China consistently backed opposing forces. Proxy wars were studied by Western and Soviet military analysts and provided a grim contribution to the Cold War tank development process. In the British Army, the Centurion was replaced from 1967 by the Chieftain. The tank was expected to be able to engage the enemy at long range and from a defensive position and be able to withstand medium artillery. The tank was expected to achieve 10 rounds per minute in the first minute and 6 per minute for the following four. The main armament was a 120mm rifled gun. Its heavily sloped hull enabled thicker armour, but meant the driver had to operate the tank in a semi-recumbent position when the hatches were closed. Lessons learned from decades of operating tanks during the Cold War have been incorporated into the tanks in service today. The Chieftain's successor was the Challenger, which entered British Army service in 1983, until it was superseded by the Challenger II. Challenger was the first tank equipped with Chobham armour. Chobham armour is a composite armour that affords much better protection than traditional metal compounds. In the 1990 Gulf War, Britain took over 200 Challenger tanks as part of its contribution to the coalition forces. In action, the GPS and Thermal Observation and Gunnery System, or TOGS, fitted to the Challengers proved to be decisive allowing attacks to be made at night, in poor visibility and through smoke screens. In total, British Challengers destroyed roughly 300 Iraqi tanks without suffering a single loss in combat. Indeed, a Challenger achieved the longest range tank kill ever when an Iraqi tank was destroyed from over 5,000 metres. The Challenger, in comparison with the M1A1 Abrams tank employed by the US Army, was more fuel efficient and achieved far greater serviceability. The M1 Abrams has been the main battle tank for the US Army and Marine Corps since 1980. Like the Challenger, it features Chobham armour and, in later versions, a 120mm smoothbore gun. During the Gulf War, its kill range of around 2,500 metres put it beyond the range of the Russian T-72 and T-54 tanks used by the Iraqis. The T-90 is Russia's current main battle tank. Evolved from the T-72, it has a 125mm smoothbore main gun and a mix of steel and composite armour. The inclusion of an autoloader means that the number of crew has been reduced to just three, commander, gunner and driver. 
With the end of the Cold War in 1991, questions once again started being asked concerning the relevance of the traditional tank. Over the years, many nations cut back the number of their tanks or replaced most of them with lightweight armoured fighting vehicles with only minimal armour protection. But in the 21st century, tanks have continued to evolve to counter new developments in anti-tank weaponry. Active protection systems, which intercept guided anti-tank missiles before they can damage their targets, are becoming important components of 21st century tanks. Although tank versus tank combat is increasingly becoming less likely, there is a reluctance to get rid of them entirely because all of the great powers still maintain large numbers of them in active forces or in ready reserve. There has been no proven alternative and tanks have had a relatively good track record in recent conflicts. Thank you.